expecting me. Okay. Um, yeah, although it's rusty, rusty, but you don't ever unlearn. So I'm feeling pretty welcomed already in the uh, milieu and, uh, this week already. Um, and also yesterday with uh, people from the dance department. So um, I want to talk and work with you around this idea of using machine learning in creative capacity. Um, and I want to do that through a tool that we uh, developed called Figment um, that's about to be open sourced. We're still working out the kinks there. Um, but the idea is that it's an uh, already freely available tool that will be more useful in the future as we add more stuff. Um, the purpose of the whole um, program that we're doing and the machine learning, um, creative machine learning approach that we are taking at St. Lucas, where, where I'm from, and I'll talk a bit in, about that in a minute, is that we are really looking at democratizing AI for creative people. That's, that's our goal, basically. There's a whole bunch of stuff going around. And if you look on Twitter or Instagram, everything's full of creative AI, but it feels a bit, um, either it feels far off, like, okay, I can never do that. Um, or everything feels a little bit the same-ish. Uh, and then there's a couple of people who are really, really into it. And we want to get to you to that level, but uh, we'll see we, if we can do that today. Uh, yeah. The, um, the idea here is that I want to get you started a little bit with AI and data sets. Not everything's going to be in the presentation. This is more going to be in a general overview. I'll talk a bit at, about Figment at the end. Um, there are some tricks or tools that we can use to set up data sets, but that really depends on the, on the use case. So the planning for today is really to give you an overview now in the morning about what we can do, how the tool works. And then in the afternoon, um, take you through it. We actually, I have some um, machines set up in the cloud for you that you can use, that you're free to use. Uh, if you want to bring your own data, or if you want to work with the data that we recorded yesterday at the park, that's, that's possible as well. Um, but I feel that's really important um, about this part, that it's, that it's really about active participation that allows you to understand what the machine can do more than just um, coming here listening to the talk and I hopefully that's still interesting but then figuring it out seeing what works seeing how your changes impact the rest of of the system and how the output is impacted by that that's really really important and allows you to sort of um actively yeah this this idea of research creation but I think this this fits into this process of like actively doing things to discover what it's going to be about. So especially people who are interested in the, in the research behind that and, and working through that and understanding what the machine does sort of has a way of building up a conversation. That's really what we're after here. Um, first, I need to, stay, to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, AI. Maybe I, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit um, Are we missing something? No, no, no. I'm just moving the screen here for a second. Does this come from my computer? I think it does. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, it's such a huge screen. So I don't know where I'm. <laughs> okay, we'll just leave it. We yeah. just... It's kind of weird. But, uh... Oh. Oh. Anybody help spotting the mouse here? Oh, it's on invisible, so it has an effect. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, that helps. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. Okay, give me one sec. Like this. So we just minimize it there. There you go. Yeah. There. There. Okay. Okay. But, Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for uh, setting that up. So before I want to talk about what AI is, maybe a little bit about my background. I have a computer science background uh, first. And then I, what I did is I studied uh, a master in graphic design at St. Lucas in Antwerp. Um, and my goal has been since after studying that is basically to combine the two. So we started doing research um, whenever that came out as sort of what we call, uh, what you call research creation, what we call artistic research. Um, I think it started out from 2004, building open source software for designers, and that gradually morphed into what we're doing now, which is about doing that same thing, but then with AI, so building these same tools, always on a focus on people who are not necessarily coders, but who are interested in the, in the technology behind it. 
So that's a little bit about my background. Now let's talk about what AI is. Are there people familiar with AI here in the room or on Zoom who have used it? Yeah. Okay, a little bit. No. Okay. I mean, other than knowing what it is like to talk about, but I, no, no practice. I haven't mm -hmm. had any practice with it. So. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's it's going to be. Um, I mean, that's that's really the goal of today is try to get you into the practice of the whole thing. In general, the, the purpose of AI is to learn the computer a mapping from A to B. That's the basic, super, super basic definition that we want to do. It's basically write a function that says, okay, if I give you A or A and B, uh, I want to give C. If I give you A, B and C, I want to make D or something. It's learning a mapping from, from one to the other. That's basically what computers did beforehand as well with simple calculations, for example, you give it a set of I don't know tax accounts and it's making an average or it calculates how much tax you have to give to the, the government or something or how much you have to pay or how much you get back. That's also a mapping, but the difference here is that mapping is much more complex between the A and the B and an example of that. Um, is for example this where we give it uh, an image of a cat and out comes the label cat so it returns this cat when i give this presentation um, or a variant uh, of this presentation last time i was here which was in 2019 and we weren't wearing masks yet then um, i asked everybody in the room like what would computers never be able to do and for me that was this already this this idea that uh, an image could then be turned into a word. So it could detect what was on the image and then make that into a word. For me, computers were always these mechanical things that would execute the instructions step by step. And in my head, there was no way to understand that this was a thing that computers would be able to do. Um, yeah, I changed my mind after that, but it's, it's super weird, right? If you still think about it, because it, like this pixel is not a cat, this pixel is not a cat, this pixel is not a cat, it's just a combination of, of stuff that, that makes it a cat. So that's that's super exciting. It doesn't always work for dogs, it's work, cats and works, dogs works as well. Um, <laughs> it works for, uh, for many objects, it doesn't always have to return one thing, it can return many things. Um, I'm now showing it with images where it's detecting what's in the image. It can detect the age, but it can also detect the sentiment. Are you happy? Are you scared? Um, are you angry? That sort of thing. It looks kind of angry. Uh, what age are you? And of course that works with sound as well. So if you, you take a sound in, it can detect the sound and um, produce what you've said. For us now at this point, this all sounds very normal and we expect machines to do it. And we even get a little bit angry if they don't accept if they don't do what they want. If we say, "Okay, Google, uh, turn the lights on," and it doesn't understand you, we get frustrated. So we expect this to work. It's kind of interesting to think about how far we've come from that. Um, text to text works as well. So this is a very very popular one, and I'll talk a bit more in a minute uh, about sentiment analysis. is very very useful when brands are trying to figure out how their product is doing online, for example, or if you have a conversation with customer service, uh, chatting with a bot, for example, they all go through sentiment analysis and they want to see how positive or negative your experience was with the brand. So this is an important uh, thing as well. All right, so how do, we, how do we get there? How do we do that? So we, we basically have to train the AI. We have to know how the AI works. And um, I love this quote by Picasso about it saying, computers are useless, they can only give you answers. And it's kind of interesting because I think, yeah, it was talking about calculators, not computers back then because they didn't exist, but the, um, the rules have shifted a little bit. I think they, at some point, they already are starting to become a bit more interesting and can give us questions. And we'll see some examples of that. Um, but I think this is the, the basic, model that you can take into your hand. If you look at classical computer systems, what they do is they work like this. Think about your tax calculation or something, TurboTax or I don't know what it's called. You take in uh, rules, you have data, and then outcome answers, right? How much do you have to pay? How much do you get back? That's the classical model of programming. What machine learning does is it sort of turns that on its head. It says, well, just give me all the data you have, give me some answers of things you've calculated in the past, 
possibly through this, this old system uh, or done by hand. And what I'm going to come up with is a set of rules. And then with those rules, we can use those rules again in this classical method to do the calculation itself. So this is for the training part. That's actually what we're doing. And if it looks like a black box, this thing in the middle, that's uh, on purpose because it sometimes can feel like a black box. But that's really, that's really the key here. So if you want to do this training, what we do is we give it all of these images of cats, for example, with the label cat. We do the same with dogs, and then the computer is going to figure out, OK, what makes this distinction between a cat and a dog? And I'll, I'll show how that works. Um, because it's, it's not just the image itself. It needs, it needs a little bit more. So it needs input data. But then what it also needs is output data. So the output data being the B, as I talked about, from going from A to B, the label. Um, and then it needs some, some way to combine the two to see if it's doing a good job. This is called a uh, loss function. And we'll look at that. So in the image recognition side, what we have is our input data is this image. The output data is the cat. And then in the middle, we have a loss function. And the loss function decides how well we are doing. How good is this result here? And this seems like a super interesting, uh, an uninteresting mathematical thing, this loss function. But it's actually quite important because changing the loss function is, depends on what do you want the computer to look at. And if you change parameters in that function, it's going to really influence what the output is going to be. If you look at speech data, we do a similar thing. One thing that's not in here is what kind of algorithm we use. And we're not going to go too deeply in that because it just keeps evolving all the time. Um, but there's one specific one that we are going to look at because that's the one we are going to use. Um, but the loss function is important because I'll, I'll, you'll see also when we talk about the system that we're using, that that really defines how the system is going to look at your images. Another way to think about it is that AI systems, so when we talk about it learns something that goes from A to B, what it actually learns is a representation of the data that is useful to predict the desired output. So what that means is, uh, and I think it's a better way to demonstrate it, if you can look at raw data, whatever, imagine that whatever this is, just dots on a page, if we try to evaluate just by looking at X and Y, where the cutoff needs to happen and we just have these parameters for x and y and we cut through it like this or like this we are never going to get all the dots right we we can't do that instead what the representation part does is it does this it, it takes a coordinate change it says well what if we actually shift the way that we look at the data what if we turn it around a little bit to get a better representation of that data and then once we have that better representation it sort of makes sense because now we can see that all the white dots are on the plus side of the x-axis and all the black dots are on the uh, minus side of the x-axis. So having a better representation makes more sense uh, in machine learning. Now that's easy enough for problems like this where it's just one very simple uh, thing and you can visually immediately see the, the differences. And this is a typical example where this is used, for example, like uh, um, this is what's called linear regression. So you have the price of a house, and then you have the size of the house, all things being equal. The bigger the house, the, the bigger the price, right? So you have like a linear line going through it, and your representation is super simple. It just says, okay, take a line that goes like this. That's like machine learning without the, the deep part of machine learning or the deep learning part. But this is already still very useful. Now, there are a couple of issues with that. Uh, one of it is that we can say, okay, let's take the data. Do we have to do something else? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, thanks for monitoring that because. <laughs> you can't do it on my computer, so. Ah, okay. okay. Why the other? Should I see somebody here? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'll try to leave this open so I can have a look. All right. So I uh, there's three uh, basically models of that, and it sort of depends on the data. You can already see that this data is a bit tricky because these outliers here, we don't really know what to do with it. And there's three possibilities. We can underfit, basically making a straight line through it and saying, okay, ignore these other ones. 
if we think about this in the context of sociology, this this all all of a sudden becomes problematic, of course, because we're just generalizing across a whole population. We can appropriate fit, which is sort of taking this curve. You can see that this curve is already a bit more complex than this one. So we have to have a bit more parameters or a bit more information, a bit more uh, knowledge to the system to actually to generate a curve like that. And then the last one is basically what's called overfitting. So it's going so deep, it's being so detailed that we actually take out these points. The problem with that is that it doesn't generalize anymore. If we do it with data like that, and then we feed it something else, another point that's somewhere off in the distance, then it won't feed, uh, it won't look at that because it doesn't know what it works like that. It's maybe weird to talk about these things in the context of creative machine learning, but it's actually quite important because we saw that um, yesterday in the talk as well, that if we if we do it with not if we don't have enough data the system can easily overfit and can easily say oh i know i've uh, we created dancers with dots and i'll show that a bit but oh i know this person because i know the dot location of the dots so i'm just going to take that person immediately and just draw draw him or her so it's really about um finding the right balance between underfitting which is way too generic and overfitting This is for simple tasks, right? This is for tasks where, uh, like the housing thing, where it's really clear where the line is going to be. The problem is that if we look at more complex models, uh, like deep learning, the parameters are way more complex. So now it's easy to visualize and see that there are dots that are missing in this part. With deep learning, it's a bit more complex. And the way that you can think about it is that it looks like this is this giant switchboard where you have all these uh, millions of parameters and um, it's very hard to decide where all the buttons need to be exactly and so that's what the machine learning is trying to figure out it's also and i'll come back to that in a minute very hard to decide which of these buttons actually trigger racism or racial bias in the system or whatever um, there's no racial bias slider that you can just slide up and down um, we're not really interested in this housing prices. We're really interested in using this for visual AI. And there are a couple of categories that we can look at. Uh, one of them is the one that we just saw, which is this. And this is called the um, uh, image detection or image labeling, uh, where we take an image and then we put a label on it. And we say, okay, that's a cat. Uh, we can do it in the other way around, and this is called image generation, where we take a label and then generate a cat out of it or an image out of it. This is much harder, of course, because the computer has much less to work with. It does only, uh, it has only basically three letters, so it has to figure out from this whole complex what that actually means. Uh, you can imagine that that's way more complex. And then you have the parameter where uh, this is called image to image translation, where you take an input image and you make it into an output image. If you've ever used um, filters, Instagram filters or something like that, that's what they do. And then there's this category of uh, what are called GANs. And GANs are basically generating an image from random noise trained on a whole bunch of images. Uh, but then the input is actually, uh, yeah, sort of useless for us the only thing that we can do with it is sort of move from one random noise field to another gradually and sort of create a movie between the images but the output is still really useful so it's um it's really about the output but it's, it's not um controllable as such that we can say okay now generate this specific cat because we don't know where that specific cat is in this in this field of random numbers so this is um generative these are generative adversarial networks um and then the ones that I want to talk about today are more these conditional generative adversarial networks or also image to image translation systems where we feed in an image and an output image and they, they have some relationship to each other. They're uh, what are called structurally similar. There is some relationship between the two images that allow the system to understand that if we give it this input image, then it can take out that output image. Um, and just to give you an idea, of how that could work. I want to talk about image recognition as sort of an example of how that works. And um, here's this uh, the same image of a cat again, and let's talk about how that could work. So first, uh, 
let's look at this. Do, do we know what this is? Any idea? No. Do we know it now what it is? No. This? Yeah. <laughs> Better, right? Uh, right. So this is my this is not my bike. It's an awesome bike. Um, but the you can imagine going back here. This is actually what the computer gets to see, right? It gets a representation of every value of this individual pixel. As you can imagine, going from this, looking at this little field somewhere randomly in the image, and then telling there's a bike on this image is actually quite hard because it's not, there's not a bike pixel here that decides, okay, this, if this is orange, then it's an awesome bike and otherwise it's something else. Um, even looking at this is super hard. And then uh, even looking at this, for us makes sense, but for a computer is still hard. So the RGB pixels are not really a good representation to learn from, just the raw pixels. The simple models that we can uh, saw before, like the housing pricing, they can be used for simple answers, but for more complex networks like these, those, those don't really work. So we need systems that are a bit more complex. And that's where we get into the field of what's called deep learning. And so what deep learning does is instead of trying to do one conversion of the image, remember the conversion or transformation is like moving the axis like this or like this or scaling it up. We do a bunch of these translations before we actually get to this output image. So instead of saying, okay, we do, we take this um, orange bike and we move its pixels or we figure out from black and white pixels or something, we do a bunch of these transformations before we get that. And here you can see a bunch of these layers, but Complex networks have sometimes 16, 32, 128 layers all behind each other. And every layer is sort of focused just on a small, small bit of the transformation. Um, the first instance might just be fi figuring out some contrast values. The next layer might be able to figure out, oh, these are faces, but features of a face. And then the last thing might be, okay, these, these are actual faces, or this is the location of the face. Um, but every, every layer by itself only has a very small thing that it can do. The way that I like to look at it is if you take uh, two pieces of paper and you put them together and you crumple them up into a ball, then um, they're super hard to entangle. You can't really tell a computer to untangle them. What you can do is say, is how to describe it step by step. So you say, okay, first take this little corner, untangle that one. Then we take this little corner and do that. And we take this one, then we take this one. And gradually what you do is these two pieces of paper sort of come next to each other. And then we can sort of untangle. Them. And that's what we are doing here, right? We're untangling this complex problem and dividing it up into little, little small transformations that we can do that then finally turn out to be the value that we want. One of the first applications they did for this is um, handwritten recognition. And this is actually a, a machine learning technique that's been used for a long time because it has a very, very uh, valuable um, need, which is to read the digits on a written piece of paper or a postcard. So if you uh, send a postcard, uh, you want to immediately see what the zip code is, and you can do that using handwritten recognition, figure out what the digits are. So there is an absolute need for that. And this is one, one of the first applications of machine learning for images. Um, and here you can see the layers that you can do. The, the benefit of this system is it's actually, you can do it with a small network and it sort of works. This is like a hello world example of machine learning, um, but it's, it's actually really fun. So you can see in the first layer what it's trying to do. These layer representations are actually things that the computer has learned are important for the image. For example, what is important is the little dots here at the end. So the, the end coordinates of the image. So this, 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 this. You can see these are represented in this first uh, learning block, this first layer of the image. Then there's uh, something that detects like horizontal lines, something that has like a blurry version of the image, and then something that detects these uh, diagonal lines going through. And each of these filters you can sort of see as a sieve so this sieve now only lets through images that have these diagonal lines. And so the next time you put an image through like a five that doesn't have these diagonal lines at all, it will not give any uh, output for this sieve, which means that if we start calculating all this up in, in later layers, that the value for four, the, the probability that this is a four is gonna be very low. 
Whereas if we put a four in and this C detects patterns like this, it's going to give a high uh, activation value and that will feed through the network and say, oh, it's probably a four because this parameter and this parameter are super important. So that's what image recognition is doing. Each of these layers are little, uh, what are called convolutions, little math mathematical operations that it's trying to do on the image that are very um, straightforward by itself, but in combination become this uh, complex network. Little cat break here. Um, so the deep learning neural network consists of all of these different layers and each layer learns a different representation of that image. The idea is that as we get farther along, the representations are no longer about, or the channels of this learning are no longer the R and G and B channels, but are actually channels of learning, channels of more in complex information about the object itself. It's still kind of hard to understand what exactly the computer is learning, especially at higher levels, but there's definitely something going on. So a first step would be something like this, and taking back to the cat, uh, this is the convolution step. And basically you see it as a, like a weird Photoshop filter. This is actually something you can do in Photoshop called the kernel um, operation that sort of says, okay, if I look at my own pixel and I look at the surrounding pixels, which ones are more important? That's what it's doing. But then what we actually end up with is something where we have these different types of layers. So we have the cat, that cat gets divided into little shapes, little sieves, little filters that say I'm looking specifically for these kinds of shapes or these kind of ear shapes, and then gradually turning them into more and more complex features that then turn out to be a cat. Um, actually, the output image is a bit wrong here because if you look at image recognition, what it does is it's always going to give a probability of a cat. It's not going to give a cat. So it's, the output is not cat, the output is a thousand values where cat has a value of 0 0.999 and the rest is value of zero or 0 0.0001, right? So it has, it can be multiple things at the same time because sometimes the computer doesn't know. Um, so as I talked about, these are convolutional neural networks. Uh, do we want to see the code of that? Maybe not. Um, but I want to show an example of this uh, because there's a already in a, it has creative uses and I sort of like this one because this is uh, made by a student a couple of years ago already 2020. Um, what she wanted to do was this project called the faces of the moon and so there's this huge tradition of people seeing things in the moon and uh, what she wanted to do was basically allow people to draw what they saw in the moon and now we have a computer uh, algorithm or machine learning algorithm that tries to figure out what that thing is. This is based on the quick draw data set, which is a huge data set by Google, having all people basically, they put it out as a game, but basically they use it for machine learning um, to allow people to draw very quickly uh, images of a cat or a beard or a, a cup or whatever. And now they have millions of images and it's super, super accurate. Um, it's really amazing. So you could draw like a cup, for example, and then if you would start with a square, it would say, oh, it's a square. And then you would add a little handle on the side and say, oh, it is like a flag or whatever. And then you would draw the side and it would be like, oh, no, no, this is definitely a mug. And then you would add these little squigglies on top and it's like, oh, no, it's coffee mug because, yeah, it's steaming. So, it's yeah, it's insane. Um, and then another project that I really like, because you could think of image recognition as, okay, but why, what's the creative use? I, I want something that generates inches. I don't want something that that already, um, that just outputs a word. But um, this is a project that I really like called Paradolia um, by Dries Everstappe, which was made in 2019. And what they did is they, they get these weird faces and you would think of these as these weird generated faces, but th these are not actually generated. Instead, what they do is they have this microphone set on these grains of sand. And whenever the, micro, the, the microscope, sorry, not a microphone, whenever the microscope uh, runs through every grain of sand and it does machine learning detection of faces, and whenever it finds a match for a face, it's going to give one of these faces. It's going to take a picture and then put that in this 
uh, ongoing uh, ongoing list gallery of all the faces faces it has encountered. So this is using machine learning technology to do it on things in the real world, but sort of tricking it into thinking it's looking at something else. So this is the, the setup. I really like this because um, it's such a, a simple, beautiful idea and it's so well executed. And you can see this little sand reservoir here as well, sort of creating the sand. Um, so this is a, a good example of even image recognition by itself being can be used as a as a creative tool. Um, the next step that I want to talk about, because this is relevant for what we're going to do today, is GANs. So GANs again start from random noise and then become images. Um, they're called GANs because uh, the, the short version is generative adversarial networks. And what they do, are people familiar with GANs? I think more and more people sort of, okay, we'll quickly go through it. The, um, the idea of the GAN is that there's two networks. So before we had one network, we had a network that would just look at the image and say what it is. Now we have two. We have one network that generates new images and one network that tries to discover what this image is. And the discriminator is not necessarily busy or, or working on figuring out what it is. Instead, it's trying to figure out if the image that gets generated is a real or a fake image. So if the image is... Um, uh, so the discriminator gets two sorts of images, either images that it has that, that are real, like images from real faces, real photographs, and it gets images from the generator who's trying to do its job to generate something that looks real enough to fool the discriminator. I think, I don't know. Um, this is a little slide about it, but the way that you can think about it is, or the way that I've learned to think about it is this idea of the the money fraud and the bank trying to discover who made the, the fake money so you have the fraudster first who's trying to make money and first it has does the worst job ever because it doesn't know what money looks like the generator never gets to see real money so it just takes a bill cuts it out of scratch paper uh, writes 100 on it gives it to the bank and the bank the, being the discriminator actually has no idea what money looks like either so it's just like oh yeah it's perfect great i'll take it and then that's round one. The loss function there is pretty high because both of them are doing a really bad job. But then the discriminator is, is sort of called to action and say, look, there's a distinction between what we give you in the training data set, real money, and what this generator is doing. Now do a better job trying to figure out. And it's like, ah, oh, okay, okay. Looks like there has to be a face on it. Okay. And so now the generator can't do its job anymore because it doesn't have a face on it. So it tries and it tries, it gets better and better. And at some point it figures out, oh, it should probably add something round like a face. And then the generator gets fooled again uh, or the discriminator gets fooled again. And so this game goes on and on and on until you get better and better uh, money. Um, I talked about the loss function, but that's really important. The generator here starts out with nothing, with random noise because it doesn't know what it generates, but also its input. So the the space that it can generate, the amount of different variations of the money is also random. Um, and this looks weird. I'm not sure if there's a slide about that later, but I think we should definitely talk about it at some point. So the generator is set up with these little blocks, right? What it's doing is it's starting from a random noise value and it basically increasing, increasing its resolution until it reaches a point where it's something that can be generated. In this case, an, a pixel image of 28 by 28 pixels, so wide and high. So in this case, a really small image, but that gives you an idea. Um, so that's its job to go from nothing and then generate an image. And each of these are these little crumbling steps that I talked about, these little um, un unraveling steps where it's trying to do these little steps to figure out what the image should look like. The discriminator does the opposite, opposite job. It takes this image and filters it down, 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 down until it re reaches one value, which is the probability that the money is going to be real or fake or the, the image itself is gonna be real or fake. And with these two in balance, um, balancing them out is actually pretty hard, but if they are in balance, the results are really remarkable. This is a, an example that I showed yesterday as well. Sorry for the people who were here yesterday, uh, but this is from uh, Jude, who is a student of mine and who has uh, did a Labo summer school last, 
a couple of years ago, 2019 as well. Um, and she generated these images of Damascus. And what we, uh, she drew them all by hand. We fed them in a computer machine. So this is the images that you can see. Um, we have these instructed images as well. And then, oh, there's no video. Is there? Yeah. Uh, and then we let the computer sort of um, get these new generated images generated from these, uh, from these input images. The second one is actually images that she destroyed trying for the AI to recreate the image. And of course, that's super hard, um, but it's, it's fascinating to see. You see that it does generate something in the middle here where the image should be. So something's happening. So it's kind of nice, but the, you could wonder, okay, why, why is it sort of morphing between these different states, right? You often see this in machine learning examples as well. There's this phase, but then it becomes this other phase and then uh, what's going on. And that really has to do with, with what the input is to the generator. So the input to the generator is random, random noise, uh, which uh, looks like this, but the random noise, um, Okay, so the way that I think about it is as a map. So you take a map of Montreal, for example, and that's your random noise. You can be at any point and you will generate a different image or see a different view, basically. But what you can do in latent space is you can decide a route from one point to the other. And as you move the route, you gradually see your view changing, which is the same if you walk around, of course. Um, so you, this is like a map, a height map or something of where everything is. And then as you move around, uh, that's what you do. Now, that doesn't mean that the locations themselves are significant because they aren't. You can't really say, oh, this is like the place where whatever that happens. But um, the walking around is interesting. So here's an example of this uh, interpolation. And you saw that with the project of Jute as well. Here we take two random points in, of, in that uh, latent space. And we can generate all the in-betweens of these values right, and in as much detail as we want. Um, so the, the, uh, this part, what we do here is this is no longer trained. This is once we have the model and we have the latent space, we can actually go really fast over these and generate new ones uh, from scratch. So the training is slow, but the inference is fast, depending on how big your model is. Some of them are uh, almost in real time. Um, and in this case, the input is this latent space value, this 100 dimensional space. Um, and it's also no more random. So even though it looks random, but if we ask for the same point, it's always going to give us the same value. So that's no longer random. Everything is mapped on a specific point. Like, okay, it's in this street, for example. And then you can take that output as a movie, traverse through this space, make it interactive, connect it to OSC so that if you move your hand or move a, a sensor, basically it changes something in that field. Um, so you can map your position in physical space to a point in latent space. So there's all kinds of opportunities that you can do once you've trained these uh, GANs. Um, a nice example of that is this work from Mario Klingerman called Memories of Passerby, also from 2019, the golden ages of AI. <laughs> um, but his, it's also, I really like the setup. Uh, he had these faces um, generated, which are part of uh, from WikiArt, which is this huge database of uh, artwork. Um, and I'm part, uh, I think, Flickr, and then sort of combining them. And it would gradually shift through latent space, changing these, uh, these faces. And there was a little comfy chair. You could sit there and look at uh, how the images gradually shifted. The little box here is actually his supercomputer machine that's actually generating these images. So he needed a place to store it, and they made this nice little cupboard here. So I really like that. Um, this project uh, is by Helena Sarin, who's done uh, a couple of interesting works, uh, still also with GANs, feeding her own material inside of the GAN, um, and, then, and then creating these prints out of them. And then this one we, we looked at uh, yesterday as well, the uh, work from Scott Eaton, the body soup. Um, he has a bunch of them. He's a photographer, but he's also uh, doing live drawing. So he has a lot of uh, new drawing images and, and he uses that in his work. So uh, I like this. He also created this sort of brush where you can paint with it, with this fleshy like uh, substance. Um, and then this is work by Anna Riedler, 
who created this Tulips work, again, a bit older, already <laughs> super old in machine learning times. Uh, but what's interesting here, and also what I, what I like about this, the, the whole setup here is that it's her taking pictures of, I think, 10,000 tulips by hand, all cut, all on a black background, and then taking all these nice pictures and then feeding them into the GAN, which gives very different results than saying, okay, I'm just going to go to Flickr, search for flower, download all of them, and then just see what happens because there's going to be a very, very different uh, factor. So this, I think, is really nice because she just does everything by hand. And the initial pictures was already an exhibition by itself, and then the AI uh, was another one. Uh, this is actually linked to the um, tulip mania of the 1630s, where tulips all of a sudden in the Netherlands became like super, super high, uh, and sort of linked to the Bitcoin mania and Ethereum mania that, that uh, went on as well. Um, so that's GANs. Uh, there's one variation on that that we don't uh, are not going to talk about now. But this one is an interesting approach where we say, OK, now we take a word and we move from that word to an image. And this is um, text to image generation, obviously. And there are a couple of uh, approaches to it. I'm first going to show you the um, earliest approach that I saw, which was ATTN GAN or attention GAN, I think it may means. Uh, because it was so, so promising as, a, as an approach. Again, they tried to learn it in reverse. So they, they gave it an image first, they gave it text, and they tried to figure out, okay, which parts of the text are important and do your thing and whatever. Um, it's not perfect, I would say. A beautiful woman with long hair and a smiling face. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I can kind of see it maybe, yeah. Uh, a robot that wants to kill all human, yeah. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> that one is obvious, but he's in the metaverse. I think it's not not available. What's interesting? So attention GAN was trained on this data set called Coco, which is um, a common object in context, and is a very famous data set where people would take images and then label them. So the idea was that, oh, we have all these labels, we have all these images, so we can train that together and that, that becomes something interesting. Um, yeah, as you can see, the results are not awesome. But what was interesting, I think, is that if we turn the process around, that means I, I can't read this. If I give you this image without the description, you wouldn't know what it is. But actually, the image recognition algorithms would because they were trained on the same data set. So an image recognition algorithm, given this image, would say, oh, woman, long hair, smile. <laughs> what? So the, the AI, it's like the two levels of AI talking to each other and sort of discovering a coded language where they say, no, look, look, this really looks like a woman. And the other one is like, yeah, of course, yeah, sure, I can see that. So because they're trained both on the same data set, they have discovered these patterns that we don't actually see, but they, uh, they do, so they can keep talking to each other. It's really, <laughs> really amazing to me that that works the other way around as well. Um, so obviously this could use some improvement and some improvement came in the form of DALI, which came out uh, one or two years ago now, I think. And DALI, I think for me at least, changed the field of, uh, again, thinking about what could computers never do, this became this, this uh, next frontier. So DALI uses a system called CLIP, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, what it's trying to do is basically mapping words and images at the same location. So if you think about this latent space that we talked about again, it's basically saying, OK, this image and this text piece belong together. Um, and by doing that, it could sort of generate these new images. They had really, because they fed it on the whole internet, they really had a problem figuring out, okay, is the AI now learning it from, by heart or and replicating what it already knows, or is it generating new images? So they have this really weird prompt saying an illustration of a baby right on diet, uh, a radish in a tutu walking a dog. They're like, okay, there's probably not so many images of that on the internet. Um, but it does that, it generates that, and you can change the prompt and it will generate these images, which is completely insane. As I said, I, I, um, I teach graphic design. So sometimes I teach bachelor students and we give these exercises to people. We say, uh, okay, make an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And they come up with these visual metaphors, right? Of, okay, yeah, it looks like 
we can take the seed and that then becomes the like avocado or like here we can put the pillow here but these are all generated they're not they're not uh made by graphic design students they're they're really there and to me this is really crazy if you think about it because it just keeps coming and coming and coming there's like endless of these um all generated so and yeah as i said endless a uh, clock in the shape of an avocado a coffee table. It, it does other things than avocados as well i'm sure um so these are butterfly tables these are purses in the shape of butterflies and again look at the variation of trying to combine these different the way that combines these different shapes together it's really interesting um and you can even do text so you can say okay i want a storefront with this specific word on it and it's trying to do its best to generate that um, or a bottle of malt marsh moss that has the word skynet written on it because why not <laughs> it's already dark enough so yeah i i used to I used to think like, okay, we have an answer for all these AI things like, okay, but the computer could never do this, could never do this. And it's sort of, I feel like these are these holes that are still left, but they're shrinking. They're becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. I don't want to, this to be too depressive, but I mean, this is where we are right now. <laughs> uh, the DALI thing is unfortunately not open source. Um, the model is also huge, so it's very hard, I think, for them to open source it. But the, there are some variations on them, and I think those are also interesting to play around with. Uh, Deep Days is one of them, but there are now uh, more different ones. All of them use actually this uh, one part of the system, which is this clip system, mapping words and images together on the same space that is available. And that is, that is a really important one. But then if you look at the output, it's actually quite nice, I think. Uh, these are still a little bit abstract, but I kind of like this. So mist over green hills, shattered plates on the grass, on the grass, sorry. And this one you can look up and you can, you can try yourself if you want. Cosmic love and attention. Uh, a time traveler in the crowd, yeah. So I really like this. Um, so that's that's uh, text to image generation, and then there's this this kind of thing which uh, I would call style transfer, where it takes the image and then turns it into a style. I'm not going to talk too much about it. There's like hundreds of filters for that. You probably are all bored with them anyway. Um, the way that they use is a system called uh, CycleGAN. Is they yeah, like here for example. Um, to do this training, but I, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but they exist. Uh, what I am going to talk about, because I think this is the most interesting approach right now, also within the scale of the things that we can manage, is this, which is uh, called conditional image generation. And the idea of conditional image generation is that we do this mapping between two images and then it can generate new images. So for example, we can make a drawing of a handbag and then, then it can do make a handbag, or we can draw the facades of a building and then you can draw a photorealistic version of a building. Or we can draw what a street should look like and you can do a photorealistic version of that street. Um, or this one, which is uh, Kaugan. NVIDIA now has made this into its own software that you can download and use, uh, where you can draw with different materials and every material has a meaning. So this is like, I can draw with rock or I can draw with uh, water and then it becomes this, um, this painting, this photorealistic painting. Um, and it's actually quite amazing because, as you can see, the reflections of the rock are also there in the water. I have a question about this. So, um, how many how many images does does the, does the AI have to contain in order to make the like that's a very realistic rendering? What like so? How many images does it take before it's able to do that? As much as possible. <laughs> Than, um, you know, or beautiful woman with long hair. Yeah. That's, like that was a, that was such a fail uh -huh. compared, compared with this. So what's the difference between these two situations? Yeah. Okay. So the model is a bit different here. What is you need a lot of images, but most importantly, you need segmented segmented images. You need a way to say to take existing images and then divide them up into the parts okay. that are the, the rock that are. 
yeah, yeah. But you have to label the whole the existing image. So it's not so much about okay, let's download Flickr and take all. Let's look for tropical island and download everything. Mm -hmm. It's also that the labeling needs to be done, otherwise it can't work. Okay. So. So what's the difference between this and like the woman with long, uh, long hair, the beautiful smiling woman, or whatever? Like, the, what's the difference between this being so successful? Mm -hmm. in, in an accurate representation and the other example that's being so strange and like un unrealistic, I guess. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to tell because as, I, as you saw with the Dali thing, it is actually possible to do it, but I think most of it has to do with the kind of context you give it or the kind of input you give it. It has to do with the algorithm in this case, this is also an image to image algorithm, which in general works better, but it's also about, um, yeah, the kind of context that it needs. The, the reason why attention again failed and Dali doesn't is because the context that's also inside of that, the, the knowledge it has of the world and of the images of the world is way, way bigger in the Dali example than in the attention again example. It's a bit unfair to compare it with this, but because what this does is it, these two images are what's or are called structurally similar. So you can see that there is a mapping here. You draw this and you expect that. Whereas with text, there's no structural mapping. One is words and the other one is an image. So the problem also is much yeah, harder, yeah. becomes okay. much harder. Okay. But still it's impressive that and, and controllable, which is interesting. Yeah. So with the HTN again, or um, is that the sort of thing where you could feed it an image of Mark Zuckerberg or whatever and it would interpret it correctly? I mean, I know it's not generating text, but you were saying earlier that uh, what we're seeing is in some sense the internal language of these. Yeah. You know, no, actually, you could do it with any kind of thing that was also trained on the same data set. Any kind of image recognition algorithm that was trained on the same data set, you could just feed in the image and it would output Mark Zuckerberg. Right. So it, it was almost giving us more insight into uh, the internal representation yes. that we are creating through this. Yeah. I wouldn't may, maybe not insight, but yeah, some some kind of yeah peek into into the black box. I would say yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Oh, I just had a question. You said that it was trained on the entire internet, and I'm wondering how the like the training data set or the labeling is done in that kind of context. Is it picking up on metadata that's already in like that's already on the internet, or is there? Uh, no, a lot of it is hand work. Coco SD, for example, is a lot of, lot of work. So people just labeling stuff? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's mostly humans. Like I, if you look at the bottom of machine learning, it's all humans doing it. <laughs> mostly we, underpaid people. We just had a great talk by Alex Hanna on the Forrester the ImageNet, which is one of the kind of foundational training data sets and then some great research just about like, yeah, a lot of that also relies on, for example, for flavor and, and there's lots of issues. Yep. Yeah, how, how this comes about. Um, which is uh, another side of the accounting department. Yeah. Um, and if anybody's interested, Alex Hanna's talk is recorded online. Uh, you want to talk about that one? Yeah. Uh, would you mind submitting? Yes. Yeah, and because it's so much work, people tend to use the same data sets over and over because they're not going to build them from scratch every time. Um, that's kind of a problem, I think, if you're working with AI creatively, or it can be a problem because you're relying on what everybody else is using. And I sort of like the fact that you can do your own thing within AI and, and, and condition the networks with the conditioning that you want instead of taking the same biases that everybody has because it's, it's trained that way. Um, yeah, this is also an example of conditional image generation going from uh, an image of uh, in this case, a mushroom to a 3D mesh of this mushroom. Again, it's already a bit older, so right now the results are even better. Uh, this is also called um, NERF, this, the system that they're using now. And NERF is going super, super fast, uh, just giving it a couple of 3D images, and then it can figure out a whole 3D mesh. So you just take a couple of images, and then it becomes a 3D, fully 3D mesh of the object itself. It's really insane. Um, I also want to briefly talk about audio AI because there is a bunch of stuff already going on in that space as well. Uh, the one that I personally used and have some experience with is sample RNN. It's awesome, but it's also super, super complex to set up, unfortunately. The way that it's set up 
or uh, what it's trying to do and the difference with audio versus image is that audio always needs a memory. It needs a way to figure out what, what came before uh, to figure out what needs to come after. So it needs to have some rhythm. And what sample RNN has done smartly is to divide that problem up into different parts, different tiers. So the first tier is concerned with just the next sample, the next level of volume that it has to create. Uh, but that's super, super low level. If you just look at the previous audio volume and now you have to decide what the next volume is, there's not much enough information that you can use. So they added these other tiers on top, which is uh, looking at what's called the frame. So basically uh, a couple of samples, 100 samples, uh, you, that's definable. And then I would, I would say at the level of the beat, it's even smaller than a beat, but just looking at that little segment of that. And by splitting that problem up, they can have different layers of memory about how the next audio is going to sound. Um, I hope this works. Oh, uh, there's this channel on the internet called the data bots with uh, a channel called relentless doppelganger. Sorry, I'm just, this is, I hope I can find this, just too good. Yeah, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> so it's trained on metal, obviously. <laughs> and it's just it's been streaming since 2019 <laughs> so yeah it's a pretty amazing concert okay i can keep listening to this forever and we will um uh so yeah, that's that's a really interesting project trained on sample RNN. As you can see again with the attention again as well, the quality is so so. Um, so OpenAI again uh, came out with a Jukebox, which actually turns out to be much better results. And what Jukebox does is it generates something in the style of something. And I think I can show that. Um, just give you some brief samples. Uh, oh wait, the screen's on the other side. There it is. So this is some, some jazz. This is all fake, right? This is uh, even the text itself is is just invented. So the lyrics are invented as well, uh, and it does all kinds of genres. The style of Bob Marley. <laughs> it's doing so, it's trying so hard. <laughs> you can. You can just feel it trying so hard. Um, I actually tried working with it, it's kind of funny because um, we wanted to use it for a project and then I, uh, it works well for the, 12, the first 12 seconds or so. You have to give it a little bit of seed phrase, like a head start. And then it always went into country and Western. So whatever I gave it is always like, no, 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 let's add a banjo. And <laughs> it's like, no, no, please just leave it alone. But it's all like that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what's, what went there, uh, wrong there. Um, yeah, so I just want to show this as well. This is a, what's called a spectrogram. It's basically a visual representation of the music. But some people have also trained um, machine learning algorithms, visual machine learning algorithms to generate audio. So moving the audio to a spectrogram like this, and I say, oh, now I have a picture and now the AI can generate another picture, turn that back into audio and then play that audio again. So a lot of these al algorithms actually feed off of each other. Um, oh, did you, can you do that with movie maps? 
So if you're like with the data points that either are already yep. here or that you create, then you can can that be converted to this kind of uh, to this group of data. Yeah, if you can turn it into an image, yeah, you can definitely do that. Uh, in movement, what I would expect, and we can show that in Figment as well, is that you can have sort of a trail of the movement itself okay. um, and then feed that trail and sort of let the AI decide, okay, what's the next frame now? If, okay. if I give you these three frames now, what the next frame should be? Yeah, not sure how well it will work, but it's, it's an interesting experience. Um, then let's, are you all okay still? Yeah, uh, let's talk about text AI. And the thing you just mentioned is actually interesting because it talks about this idea of memory, which is super important. The most easy way to think of uh, this or the easiest implementation are recurrent neural networks. The idea is that they have a little bit of memory. You see this little feedback loop there, and that's the memory of the cell itself, remembering what it has seen. So a recurrent neural network, we predict between brackets, the next character or word, and that's how it generates new text. So we ask it to, okay, what do you think comes next? And then we ask it, and again, what do you think now comes next? If this is the input, and it's sort of like a sliding window sliding over the text, and we give it a bit, a bit more of context or a bit less of context, depending on the algorithm. And then it can sort of generate these new things. So we can create a poet or, or writer with that. Uh, this is already a project by Andre Karpati, who is now head of AI at Tesla, I think. Um, and he wrote this about RNNs, and RNNs are, I mean, they're super, super basic, but they're amazing. The, the, the thing that come out of it, they're really slow, but um, the, the results are really crazy, actually. Um, I like them because they're also like small AIs. So you, can, you can try that in an afternoon, play around with it if you know some code, and then see what comes out. There's a, a more complex version of that. Uh, and so now RNNs are used in that context, but attention or transformer networks are used much more. They're more complex, uh, but the results are also better. And this is a typical one from GPT-2 or GPT-3, which I, are you familiar with the system? It's basically what everybody's using to generate text nowadays, and it's everywhere. So it's always also trained on all the text of the internet, basically. Um, you give it a prompt and then out comes the rest of the text. So this text talks about, okay, Legolas and Gimli advanced on the orcs, raising their weapons with a harrowing war cry. Note that we didn't say that this was from Lord of the Rings. This is all because the AI knows all the text. This is already, it has already figured out that it truly, uh, this is about AI and, uh, sorry, about Lord of the Rings. So it introduces Adam Gordon, who's also in Lord of the Rings, for example, and talks about that. Um, it's really amazing. And just if you look at uh, what it produced, it's really, really convincing. Although if you start reading it closely, you can actually feel that it's not really correct. There are some things structurally that doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you just read it, 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 feel it over, it works. And this is also really scary when you're thinking about fake news or things like that, because you can just generate these things endlessly. So here, for example, it says, I'll never forget, cried Gimli, who had been in the thick of the battle, but hadn't taken part of it, which doesn't make sense, right? But yeah, you already should, are digging deep before you understand, like, okay, this, this feels off. Um, so a, oh, wait, I couldn't hear like that. Uh, an example where that is used, of course, is the chat box, uh, which you are familiar with. And then a really amazing game uh, that came out of it called AI Dungeon. Uh, Fenwick was <laughs> talking about that as well. And AI Dungeon is basically this GPT-2 or GPT-3, but then uh, used as a game. So you can type a prompt and then it will do the rest of the game. So you can say, I want to whistle for one of the dragons to come back. And it just, that's what you say. And then it comes back. So it's like an old school text adventure game, only it takes up million I mean, gigabytes in your hard drive because it needs all this data for a text adventure game but it's amazing because you can type whatever you want uh, transform in a dragon eat the moon sure do it um whatever i tried it and uh this was what it came out with uh, <laughs> i uh, i left the prompt off actually oh, okay. yeah so the first prompt I didn't do, and then I said, you say, sure, oh, Jesus. Okay. And then, yeah. 
Um, and this is also something that I came up with uh, where I said, okay, scream. <laughs> so uh, for me as well, this was a, a completely amazing thing and I hope you ever get the chance to play with it. They completely nerfed the game now because of course everybody was using it for their weird fantasies. But um, it's, it's just amazing to have a game where you can do anything you want basically within within your own imagination. That's really, really cool. Um, and then that's used, of course, in a lot of applications where you wouldn't actually think this would work, but it does because it has trained on all the text of the internet. That also means all the uh, text of all the code, all the HTML pages, for example. So here is a very simple example where you can say, I want a button that looks like a watermelon and it generates HTML and CSS code for you that looks like a watermelon. Yeah, but you can change it and then it will do its best and then change it. So yeah, this is really, really crazy that, that this just works. And this is actually without specifically training it on code. It's just because it knows all the text already. Um, this is actually turned into a product now. So if you use uh, uh, Visual Studio Code, there's a uh, plugin that you can install called GitHub Copilot that writes code for you. The only thing you have to do is write a comment that describes what you want the code to do, and then it's gonna write the code for you. So in this case, I want a, a sentiment detection algorithm, sort of meta about the whole thing. Uh, and so I, I type, okay, determine whether the sentiment of text is positive, use a web service, and then it just automatically generates all the code uh, for you. What is this source? Uh, where, where is this to be found? This is, a, this is called GitHub Copilot, and you can use it right now. I use it all the time, actually. It's super useful. I actually get annoyed by it if it doesn't know how to write the code for me. Um, <laughs> so I'm already at this stage where, yeah, I'm like, come on, this shouldn't be so hard. Just write some code. What do you think about the code? Like, does it code? Or it's horrible. It's no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's okay if I you sort of learn to live with it, I would say. You learn what kind of code it's good at and what code it's it's gonna be bad at. It's really good at re, uh, repeating patterns, for example, or doing things that everybody's doing. Like, okay, I want to resize some images to that size or that size, and I want, here's a folder and download that. It's, it's good, just gonna write the code. And that's convenient because otherwise I have to look up the documentation and think about that. So that really makes sense. For code that's a bit more, involved, I would say, it becomes much more complex and it's gonna make subtle errors that are really hard to figure out. So you have to pay attention to what it's writing. Um, but for for many tasks, especially if there's, okay, I have an X or Y with a height, whatever, or RGB, I can write the red and he does the green and the blue and the alpha for me, for example, whatever operation that I want to do. So for those kinds of things where it's working in analog with what I'm writing, it's super useful. Yeah. Um, and it's been used more and more. And this is trained on all the on all the code that's on GitHub. So there's a lot of stuff. What languages does GitHub Copilot use? Uh, programming language? Yeah, you can do all. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can hear you. <gasps> what? It's crazy. So you can ask it to, to write in Python and it will do yeah. that. Yeah, so, yeah, so the example actually has a bunch of these tabs here uh, where it, it works in Python really well, it works in JavaScript, it works in basically any kind of coding language, CSS, HTML, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's, I think it's really helpful in democratizing writing code, even though you still have to do it, but it becomes a bit easier because, um, yeah, it's just, it knows all the code already. So it will use that. It that also means that it's gonna make the same mistakes that human coders does, and it does that. Um, but yeah, still useful. So yeah, I show that. And then of course that brings me to the ethical parts of AI. <laughs> um, because you can imagine that it's going so, so quickly and so far that we really have to take a step back and think about, okay, what does it mean for AIs to, 
to do all these things? What is it learning? One of the main things that comes up here is algorithmic bias, which is basically our bias, but then turned into an algorithm. Um, and the way that you can think of this is the, the algorithm has learned things from the real world, but the real world is also not so clean and nice. And it's just taking that and putting that in the algorithm. The problem is that it becomes really hard to um, take out the parts. And remember that big switchboard that I showed you, this mixer panel? It becomes really hard to say, okay, this is, the, this is a slider that controls that because it's just taking over our own biases. Um, that's used, of course, in things like predictive policing, where they decide, okay, where is crime going to happen next? Um, and the AI figures that out, looking at the past data. So what happens is that you get a loop of more police going to the neighborhoods where crime typically happens, thereby discovering more crime, because, of course, people are uh, always going to do things if, people, if uh, police are watching carefully, uh, you're jaywalking or whatever. And because they're not looking at the other neighborhoods, because they're all focusing on these neighborhoods where supposedly a lot of crime is happening, this again confirms their bias that that's the neighborhood that they should be really active in sort of reinforcing that idea. Um, with face analysis, there's much uh, opportunities. Uh, yeah, would you be able to comment on Timid Gerberu getting fired or big tech leading these ideas? I, I, comment a little bit about this. I don't want to specifically go into Timit Gebru's case for Google because I'm not so familiar with it. We should probably ask her. But you, I don't know who's asking the question, but that's a great machine agency question and certainly something that we're, you know, we've talked about in our kind of policy around AI. So yeah. just keep following the machine agency. <laughs> those yeah. Did you hear Fenwick? So he says, just keep following machine agencies. I agree. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's really, yeah, that's really a policy issue. Um, yeah, it says thank you. <laughs> You're not wrong. Whoever yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is, it's not, it's not uh, just a theoretical thing. This is actually a company that exists called Faceception that just figures out from the face itself whether you're a high IQ academic researcher, professional poker player or terrorist. And you can just get that. People actually integrate that into job interviews, which are now mostly remote through Zoom. So they would add this to their to the webcam feed of you and they would do this real-time analysis to figure out if you're a terrorist or you're actually being able to be hired. Um, not sure how legal that is, but it's 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 out there and the potential for abuse is, is very, very uh, valid. Um, this does go a little bit into Joy Buanwini, who together with Timnit Gebru did this research for Google and then got fired. Um, but the, the talk she gave, and there's a really good video about that called Coded Bias as well on Netflix, that really goes into detail about that, that whole um, aspect of classifying and machine learning algorithms and how they were like to, uh, react better to lighter males than darker males or lighter females than darker females because of the training data set, because of the input we give it, because of how the data is biased. Um, the way that I like to do this is by showing an actual example and showing how this is not necessarily starting from an evil intent. And I think that's really important. If you try to do that, just from scratch using the normal approach, nothing fancy, nothing that says, oh, I'm just gonna insert some racism here. Then you end up with that problem. And that's, that's really one to, what I wanted to show you because for me, that was really a real way to look at that. Um, so here's an example from a blog post from 2017 called how to make a racist AI without really trying, um, where Robin Spear actually designed a sentiment classifier and show you, and I want to walk you through it. So a sentiment classifier, what it does is it goes, uh, it takes a piece of sentence and it says if that's positive or negative. So that's very useful and for a lot of context. What you want to do first is get some text. Uh, we often use word embeddings, which means there are words that are linked to numbers. So we know what, what the value is of that word, where it is in space. For example, man and woman would be somewhere in the similar region and dog and cat would be similar in another region. So it's basically converting that word to a number. Then we have to have training and test data set with some idea of, okay, what are some negative and positively sentiment words? Um, and then we already need to train this classifier to recognize 
if a word is positive or negative based on this word I'm adding. So a word here is that a positive word, a word here is that a negative word. Um, and then what we can do is compute these sentiment scores, looking at all of these words together and computing a score, right? And then profit, I don't know, sell it to a company. So I'm going to go over all the parts. So words embeddings, what are they? They're basically uh, words mapped to points in space. Again, think of Montreal as our map here. The word is, every word is somewhere on the street. What's not important is the word it's, or the position of the word itself, but it's relative coordination to something else. This is something that, that was a real breakthrough in, in doing uh, text analysis, is figuring out that, the, that there are similar arrows pointing in the same direction. So the, the arrow pointing from man to woman, it goes in the same direction as the arrow going from king to queen. And so you can make these interesting translations. This is also how machine translations work, for example. They look for words that are similar, but in another language, going, pointing in a similar direction. It's all <laughs> very, very brief and skipping a lot of stuff. But this is, this is a really important aspect, right? Converting these words into numbers. Now, how do we get positive and negative sentiments? Well, one thing that we can do is look at existing data sets. We can look at what are called sentiment lexicons. We also look at IMDb movie reviews, restaurant reviews. All of these are text with a score. Uh, worst food I ever had, worst Indian food I ever had, score zero, three, zero of one or one out of five or something. Oh, this is the best Italian restaurant, five, five stars, whatever. Um, yeah, this is the room. I'm not sure if you saw the room, otherwise it's required viewing for everybody. Uh, this person gives it 10 out of 10, so it's probably a really good movie. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's the worst movie ever but it's the review itself is really funny but you would take this and then uh use that score and use that text to sort of an, align the two together right and of course this review is sort of funny so it doesn't really work but most reviews kind of work or at least that's the idea all right some code we don't want to go too deep in that uh, but the idea is that we are um training training that data on these vectors so these positions um, and then we are fitting this, uh, we'll see that in the, the later example as well. We're fitting this, letting it run for a while, and then what comes out is a sentiment score. So we can type in a text, and out comes a score, the value, the sentiment. Positive score, positive sentiment, negative score, negative sentiment. Easy enough, right? And because this is trained on uh, text and it knows about text, it will always give a score, no matter what you type. Even if it's an empty string, even if it's just garbage, it's always going to give a score. Um, it doesn't really care, right? So it, this example is pretty cool, gets a high score. This example is okay, a bit lower. This example sucks, minus one. All right, ready? Fine. Put it into action. Yeah, use it for something. Um, it looks fine, right? If, we, if that's all we do and we test this with these sentences, it looks like we're done. We, we don't have to do anything anymore. But maybe we can ask it a bunch of different questions. Maybe we can ask, let's go get Italian food. And that gets a really positive score. Let's go get Chinese food, maybe a bit less. Let's go get Mexican food. Oh, that's not so good. Uh, or let's just do it by names. My name is Emily. All right, 2.2, great. My name is Heather, 1.3. My name is Yvette, 0.9. Ooh. My name is Shanika, minus 0.47. So, but these are just points in space. So, mm -hmm. there's, I don't understand why a location is good or bad. So, I'm thinking in terms of like, like if I'm moving, I know this sounds weird, maybe it's a stupid comparison, but like if I'm moving my body in space, my hand is over here, it's like it's got one XYZ coordinate. If it's, if I'm over here, there's a, maybe a negative XYZ mm -hmm. coordinate. I'm just locating myself in, in space. So right. like if there are words that are mapped in space, do you know what I mean? Like I could correlate where my body is in space to where words are mapped in space. Right. I don't understand why this or this has any positive or negative connotation. So what if you're just talking about words being mapped in space, what 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 is what does it mean to have a positive or a negative correlation? Because I'm just thinking of my body in space. I have no, no positive or negative correlation with any location. Right. 
if it's just about randomly mapping points in space, it would be right. But the thing is that these word embeddings actually try to give meaning to where each word is. They try to give a location to each word. They try to decide by using, again, some kind of obviously biased system that yeah. some words belong together and other words don't belong together. So it's like, in a way, it's a negative, it's like a fallacy or a logical fallacy to suggest a sentiment for word locations. That, that's what I'm that's what I'm not getting because it's like if this were about analyzing movement, there's a neutrality to like whether my body is here or yep. here. True. And for word locations in terms of machine learning, it's like I, I just think that there seems to be a, a, a flawed logical leap to assign sentiment to text the location of text when yeah, yeah you're right but it's 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 tricky because it sort of works and people feel like it sort of works so people are going to use it and it has an obvious benefit that it can now be automated automated so if you again do this with customer service thing you can decide what customers probably need more help because the words they're using sound negative so you want somebody like a supervisor coming in or something yeah. or looking at that review again because maybe that wasn't the kind of review that we're looking for mm -hmm. so there's all these kinds of different uses for it why why people wanted to do it this is not just because it's a random thing to do people actually need this there's, there's a, a valid use for it actually i do have an example for that um this is where it was used for google has this idea of what's called a cloud talent solution where you can give it a cv letter a cover letter and then it's going to figure out that sentiment score and decide if this person needs to be hired or not or get in for an interview now but remember this works on any score any interview is always any letter is always going to give you a, a score back even if the letter itself it turns out that only the name is important you wouldn't know because you just get all these different cover letters, you put them in the system and out comes a score. You hire some people, you don't hire some other people and everything seems to be well. It's only when you start asking these questions like, okay, what if we take out the name or maybe change the name to something else? Does the score change? Should the score change? Do we actually don't want to hire Shaniquas but do we do all we want to hire our Emilys? I don't know. Um, and is it only about the name? Maybe it's about something else. Maybe it's about certain hobbies that people play where we know, oh, if people play lacrosse, that's like, uh, they come from a very different background than uh, if they play, I don't know, uh, hockey or some other sport or tennis or basketball, for example. So it's not just only about the name, it's about all of these words in space that all have a meaning uh, and that are mapped to our, the way that our society works as well. Yeah. There's a way to think about the negative way that like so these like kind of these um uh, more like kind of marginalized communities are ending up in they're ending up in territories around other negative words like is that kind of way to think about it that they have a close spatial relation because of bias data or well like there's there are two data sets right there's yeah. one is the word to fake that converts the word into space that doesn't neg necessarily have a positive or negative sentiment the other one is the movie reviews and in the movie reviews what we see is often depictions of people uh, where you have this typical biased representation, stereotypical people of how Chinese people are portrayed, how Mexican people are portrayed in movies. And so that filters through the whole system. So uh, that, that's the reason why these two are aligned. Yeah, it's not just the word to vec itself, which already has some maybe problematic clustering, but then it's adding another layer on top that, that then gives uh, a specific score to each word in, in space. And then that combination can become really problematic. Yeah. Um, and it's really hard to fix because how do you, and I talked with Finwick about it, how do you take it out? We are not neutral. We can't say, okay, there's a neutral version of this that then is the right, for, the right way to do it, right? There's, uh, or do we, do we do that beforehand? Do we try to uh, remove the bias afterwards? Do we clean it up? So it's, it's super tricky. Again, we, all we are left with is this big black box with all these sliders. So we can't really control that that way. And this is not a theoretical problem. This is something that Google, for example, did. They, they had this problem where 
they get brown, uh, typical African-American people, and they were often labeled as gorilla. So if you searched in your photos for gorilla, you would actually see your <laughs> black friends there. And they're like, obviously not good. And they fixed it by just removing the label gorilla. So you couldn't search for gorilla anymore. It would just be fixed, like check mark done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world and they can't figure it out. So it's not an easy, easy problem. I think this is one of, one of the conversations presently, a lot of why we're focused, like a lot of my work is focused on AI policy because there's questions like quite centrally, are these things that can be resolved themselves and when they're implied in high risk applications, uh, is that appropriate? And so, in you know, there's a whole issue of what the kind of stack here, and I think Tim Eckert Drew would talk quite actively about what it means to be black in AI and the barriers. And Alexandra resigned the day before coming to Concordia to talk through just the kind of institutional racism they encountered. Uh, she encountered at an organization like Google. So there's questions about who is building the AI, and then what are the ways of, of, of deploying it. And then a final question of what are the actual fixes? And I think to me, this is what's really significant as a regulatory tool, the fix is to remove it. There's no actual way of recalibrating the AI system to accommodate for this bias. It just has to be cut. And that's seen across a number of these kind of automated systems, including say Google's ad tech, where it often exit markets. So for example, you can't advertise for, um, Oxycontin or methadone treatment centers because of the level of fraudulent ads. And so they just exit it. So there's something here that we're getting at, which is part of this kind of conversation. I think part of the possibilities we're seeing here is that this is a very instrumental application of AI. And part of what we're trying to open up, and I think what's really fantastic with Frederick Chuck, is that we're trying to think about what are the possibilities that are not simply trying to think about AI in very applied and, and, and applications that, regardless of the technology, are largely based on automating and, and uh, and, and trying to kind of cut costs on service delivery, particularly for marginalized populations, which is mm -hmm. something that the work of uh, um, uh, uh, Virginia Eubanks books are really good about that. So, all, but I'll say these are you know great great questions and something that's being worked through in the field that presently. You know, it's something that like you know raises a number of kind of issues uh, about the, the feasibility of AI in certain cases. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, because this doesn't feel like a fix, right? It feels like giving up, basically. Yeah. And I think Fenwick might be a bit more pragmatic to, to that approach. For me, as a sort of tech optimist, this just feels like, no, 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 there should be a better way to fix it. And I can imagine the Silicon Valley people are also like, no, 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 we can, we can fix this in a, in a better way than just removing it. But that's, in the end, what turns out that the, they had to do. Um, and it comes into a lot of these issues as well, like, okay, should we remove uh, gender, for example, from, from like as a, as a parameter or as a balancing parameter or something we want to look at, um, and, or, or, or uh, skin color or something. Do, the, do we, are we able to advertise with these parameters in mind or not, or do, do we just remove them? Um, and it feels maybe a bit far off again from the machine learning thing, but Clip itself, which we talked about, is also trained on this on, on this huge data set of words. So in Clip, again, this is the system that's used to generate these nice looking images where you type text and it generates images. Um, it's immensely powered because it has so much combined knowledge of mapping these things to the same location. But again, hearing this word location, now you probably think, ah, okay, so there's these weird clusters there going on. That's an issue. Another issue is that Clip and uh, GPT-3 took so long to train and cost so much money, it cost millions of money to train just one AI that it's very hard to do it again. And so now it's sort of stuck in 2019, which means a lot of things about pandemic and Corona and things it doesn't even know about because it's, it's, it's already past that. So it's, it's in a different world of its own that, that doesn't know about pandemics and coronavirus. So maybe it has a happier memory than we, but um, it's also, that's also a, a bit of a problem. Not saying that this is something that should be discarded by, for sure, but it's really uh, good to be able to, to really think through what it's going to produce because it has so much knowledge of the world, um, but it's still looking through a certain lens. And that's actually the part where I want to come to today as well is what I really like is this idea of controllable AI or smaller AI, where actually all of the parts itself 
are things that we can do ourselves. I already showed the work of Anna Riedler, which I think is a really good example, taking all of these flowers by hand, cutting them out, making pictures of them, and then feeding that in. And then that is its own little world, right? The AI only knows about these flowers. There's not this whole issue with race, racial bias and whatever. Uh, it's, it only knows about this part. And it, I sort of think that that has a beautiful aspect to it, that the AI itself starts out as just a blank canvas that you can then fill up with your own thoughts and ideas. Um, the system that we want to do today, and I, I think it's a good idea to do this uh, after the break, but I just want to go briefly into it. It's called Picks to Picks, and Picks to Picks, uh, what it does is it um, does conditional generation, so image to image translation. The way that we set it up yesterday and talked about yesterday and want to do it today maybe as well, is that we give it two images and it learns the mapping between the two. We actually use this for a project uh, at Labo, the summer school, where we created a virtual AI dancer. Um, I think I have a small clip of, oh no, that comes later. So it's trained on a body and then the points of that body in, in space. And then the AI learns mapping and sort of does the opposite. So it takes the points and then makes a body out of it. That's, that's what the AI is doing, or that's what it, we are asking the AI to do. Initially, it's doing a really bad job at it. So we take the points and it gives us that that won't do, but then quickly it improves until it really becomes this, um, this body. So here you can see the, the different steps of the training. And then a short clip of the, of the AI, of the AI dancer dancing. No. no. So all of the video is pre-recorded and the controlled video is also pre-recorded. Okay. So the person controlling it does a dance by themselves. We record that and then we feed that into an AI and that becomes an AI dance, like a, like a performance that was done afterwards. Yeah. Like a recording of a performance you, you could think okay, of. So this is not like the flowers or it is like the flowers. The flowers are also not real time. Right, right, but so, but compared with the flower project, because this is like, in a way, like all the AI knows is this, like yep. the AI yep. only knows the flowers. So yep. just can you compare the two structures of how that's made? Just so I yeah, so the main difference I think is that we, here with the flowers, we just give one bunch of data, like just flowers. Yeah. And the input to the flowers is basically random. So we can get uh, any flower out of it, but we don't have any control over what specific flower. Here, what we can do is we can feed it a specific position in space mm -hmm. and it will generate an image of that position in space. Okay. So you can stand like this and the AI will also look like this. Okay. Or you can record a video of saying, I want to do this movement mm -hmm. and then it's gonna give you that movement back. Unfortunately, not real time because our computers aren't fast enough yet, okay. but we're getting there. Okay. It's really close. Um, so, and then I want to talk about some tools for AI. There's a one that you might already be familiar with, which is called Runway, which also has this idea of being super friendly. They sort of switched now to uh, doing it for video, which is still interesting. You can remove somebody from a video, for example. Um, but they used to have these really in intricate tools. Unfortunately, they don't have it anymore. Um, there's Google Colab, which is a bit more hardcore, but a lot of the interesting stuff is, is over there. It's still, I like it because it's raw and it's like a jungle of stuff, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it takes some, some getting used to. What we try to do in our research is basically make our own uh, software on that, seeing on the problems that we have with training AI. So we did two of them. First is uh, Gandalf, which allows you to upload your own assets and then build a GAN model. So these flowers, for example, you could send them to uh, Gandalf, create your own little uh, generative networks using these blocks, and then it would give you a model back uh, that generates these things. Uh, this is what we used for the project by Jude that you saw with the images of Damascus, the little drawings, uh, we used that. The problem is that it's linked to Google and we actually have to ask people to pay for it because you can't run it on your own computer. Um, it's your computer will be too slow to do it. So you have to run to some machine in the cloud. So we worked on a second application um, called Figment and that's the one that we are 
going to discuss today. Um, it has a bit of a different structure right now. Um, it more looks like this right now, but it's basically, um, are people familiar with touch designer or use touch designer? Yeah. Um, it's basically a very visual approach of working with these. So you have these blocks that really work with visuals and then you can combine them. In this case, this is a basic setup that we can do for training and generative AI for dance, for example, by taking a, a movie, detecting the poses, in this case, drawing wood with dots, uh, and then combining these images side by side. And that's, it doesn't actually do the training. What it does is the preparation step before the training, which is already really important to do because otherwise there's no way to, to work with that. Behind all of these things is of course the code. Uh, you can actually go into that and look at all of the code itself and make your own notes if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, they're all written as shaders, which we may run super, super fast, uh, as fast as your computer can handle basically. And so we did that. So we did uh, yesterday, we did a training uh, session uh, with a couple of dancers here. Uh, Matthew was one of them. Um, and so the purpose of Figment is to create these training images and to make that as easy as possible because it's already a little bit tricky if you don't know how you would do that. So uh, you give it an image and then uh, here it builds this, uh, this model of the person. Uh, not just one, of course, but it builds endless training images. So now I have about 5,000 that's now training in the cloud. Um, and then while it's training, uh, you can, uh, after a while, so it takes a couple of hours and then you get some output back. The training itself, and this is what we're going to do today, but I uh, suppose we're going to do that after the break, is to use a system called uh, uh, Gradient, which is by a company called Paperspace. I'm not sure they're selling it well if you look at their, <laughs> if you look at their, uh, their starting image. Uh, that's also my reaction when I'm meeting bad code for the first time. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. So we, we sign up for an account and I'm gonna skip this part. We'll talk about that in the afternoon, how we do the whole training thing, but I want to show you some of the output already. So here you can see it's training. So it's now at 18,000 or it was uh, this morning at 18,000 steps. So that's the input image. That's what it should, should give. And then the predicted image, you can see Lucy there, sort of, sort of a distorted version of her. Um, and then you get a whole bunch of uh, output images. And so this is, this is the first uh, Lucy that it came back with. Uh, and then it gradually improved. So these are really, really fresh, right? They're from this morning that I took, uh, but I kind of like, like these already. And you can see it gradually improving over time, uh, getting better and better at, at figuring out the genes band. And note, these are all created from little lines, right? So all the system has to work with is, well, of course it knows this mapping, but are these lines, that's how it has to recreate the image. Um, it also does a pretty good job with the shadow. We had, a, we had a white wall and then some lights in front of it. So it has to recreate the shadow as well, not just the image. And it's already doing a pretty good job with that as well. So um, if you want to uh, join me this afternoon, uh, I'll walk you through the whole process from getting the data. We can use the, the, the data from the dancers or we can use a uh, different data if you want. We can also talk about that, how to get that from Pinterest or whatever. Um, I'll have some machines ready for you to set up in the cloud. And then what we can do basically at the end is uh, let it run, see how far we can get. And then we can also take new data and then produce a movie out of that. Um, this is an example of an AI that was created in uh, I think about two hours uh, that I did together with uh, um, somebody from St. Lucas uh, called Maureen. And this is uh, an AI that's, that's basically uh, based on the face mesh. So it's not the body, but uh, the mesh of the face. And you can hear her talking about uh, being an AI artist. So I'll, I'll show that clip and then I'm done for now. Can you describe your appearance? I like to picture who I'm talking to. I can't possibly have an appearance. Do you see yourself as an artist? I do, but I'm not quite clear what the hell I'm doing that. I love to know how artists get inspired. Who's your favorite artist? I'm always inspired by how much I'm able to dig and learn from people who have worked on my work. I was inspired by my, my life, my music, where I've chosen to express myself through music. 
the way I write, the way I write art, and how I keep telling myself stories. Yeah, it's the most egocentric AI ever, but I'll, I'll uh, leave the last word to Maureen. So thank you. And then uh, we see each other this afternoon for the rest. Thank you. Yeah, so let's come back in. I, I think uh, so. All to say is that uh, it, so those in Zoom land too, thank you so much for sticking around. So, what we'll do is a similar format for the afternoon. We'll probably change the room around for folks who can make it, and we'll be we more of a hands on workshop. Again, um, we'll come back in around one o'clock. Is that? Do we say one or two? I don't know. Uh, what time does it say? Oh, is it two? Uh, second. I yeah, I don't have it here. No, I get, I get, I get. It's like a lot of time.